church. Um, there is just one father. There is one, one father, one teacher, one rabbi. He is, he is our father God. Um, this morning, I'd like to welcome Pastor Brett Spalding, who is going to be our speaker today, and his wife, Kathy. It's been a while since I've seen him, so welcome. It's good to see you guys. I can hardly wait to give you a hug. I do have a few announcements. Um, want to thank everyone who came and packed OCC boxes yesterday. It was a ton of fun, a lot of fellowship, and the total that is sitting there is 205 boxes. So there will be 205 boxes and other boxes that people may have at home that will add to those boxes and go overseas. Uh, one other announcement that I did want to highlight was that on Sunday, November 19th, there will be a Thanksgiving service here after church service on Sunday, but that afternoon at 3 o'clock there will be a community Thanksgiving service, which is a service that joins with other churches in the, in the area, and there will be music and fellowship, and it's just a way of getting to know one another and people in our community and it's just really a, a wonderful service to start off the the holiday season with Thanksgiving and then moving into Christmas but that's at three o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday so do take time to read the rest of your announcements please use your prayer cards so that it makes that whole process a little bit easier and now if you'd stand and take a moment to greet your neighbors with a piece of Christ be awesome and then join us with our praise songs. and almighty God, before whom we humbly bow and pray, allow our lips to sing your praise, direct our steps into pathways of service, and lead our hearts to biblical insight, so that worship and witness may combine into a wholeness filled with your power and love. Amen.
seated. Griffin, you did a great job singing. I love our extra singer this morning. Are you going to help me this morning? Huh? Okay, so. Carver, I need your help. Can you help me? Maybe. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll get him started. So our children's sermon today is about practicing what you preach. And as Jesus and his disciples were in the temple area and the teachers, the Pharisees were all there doing the teaching. They came in their fancy robes and and big personalities and you know we're we're have all the all the teachings and yet when they left the temple they didn't really practice what they were preaching and and telling everyone to do and the disciples were somewhat confused in talking with jesus and it's like you know what do we do here they're not really living by the standards that they're asking everyone else to do and you know and so jesus's comment to them was you do as they say, not as they do. And things that we need, things that we need to live by. And as I have Carver in Sunday school, yeah, there is fire there. So Carver, you you do see fire. So can I ask a favor of you? Yeah, I know you could blow it out. Can I ask a favor of you? Can you stand right here in front of me? You remember in, in Sunday school when we stand up and, and sing songs? Can you help me do something? We're gonna play like, it's like a game. Have you ever played, have you ever played Simon Says with Mama? Like Simon Says, clap your hands, and you clap your hands. Or Simon Says, pat your head, pat your head. Okay, well, we do a song that's almost like Simon Says, so I need you to help me. So stand up, I want, I want, I want, oops, <laughs> don't push. All right, I want you to show everyone how good that you listen to what we're doing. So here it goes. If you're happy and you know what, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know what, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know what, and you really want to show it. If you're happy and you know what, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, turn around. Turn around. Spin around. Turn around just like, here, turn around. Turn around. Turn around, turn around. All right, if you're happy and you know what, turn around. If you're happy and you know, so here comes the last one. If you're happy and you know what, say, what do you say? Amen. Oh, amen. If you're happy and you know what, say amen. Oh, amen. Oh, if you're happy and you know what, and you really want to show it, if you're happy and you know what, say amen. Amen. So then we all do all four. But Carver, this is what I really want you to remember. These are all the things that Jesus was saying, that when we learn something really special about his love, we need to say amen all the time. OK? And so we, we do, we do the, the good things that we learn and not do what we're not supposed to. So can we say a prayer? All right? Thank you, God, for teaching us about your love, and may we always do the right thing for you. Amen. That's my grandson, <laughs> with whom I am well pleased. Uh, let's have a prayer for illumination. 
We open up the scripture today, Lord. Please open us up to its mysteries. Make the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart pleasing in your sight. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Today's reading is from the book of Isaiah, uh, the chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. The heading on chapter 6 is Isaiah's commission. And Isaiah experienced a dramatic call from God to become a prophet. Verse 5, woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard a voice, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. He said, go tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding, be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Here ends the reading. Like my brother, I struggle with pulpits, so. It's great to be here. I know a lot of you and some of you don't have a clue who I am. I'm David's brother, and I started my pastorate here, and I thank Blaine Christian Church for helping me to develop, for listening to me, and um, going through those struggles of early ministry and seminary with me, and tolerating my practicing on you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Our second scripture reading today is taken from the Gospel of Luke, and it's set on the north end of Lake Gennesaret or the Sea of Galilee. And there's a number of natural amphitheaters, uh, if you will, on the north side. And, and when Kathy and I were in Israel several years ago, we were fortunate. We got to go. And you could sit on these hillsides and somebody would sit and read on the shore of the lake and it was amazing how good the sound was and everybody could hear. So the story is set there. And you'll notice in the story that nothing is said of the content. So when nothing is said of the content that Jesus preaches, that tells us what? that the events are what we're supposed to focus on. So Luke 5, 1 through 11, as the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's word, he was standing by Lake Gennesaret. He saw two boats at the edge of the lake. The fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the land. Then he sat down and was teaching the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he looked to Simon, put out into deep water and let your nets down for a catch. Master, Simon replied, we've worked hard all night long and caught nothing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they did this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me because I'm a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners. 
Don't be afraid, Jesus told Simon. From now on, you will be catching people. Then they brought the boats to the land, left everything, and followed him. Story starts out innocently enough, right? Hey, Peter, help me out. The crowds are starting to press in a little bit. You mind putting your boat out and I'll just speak from the boat? Everything's great. After teaching, Jesus looks at Peter, and this is where we start to get a little dicey, right? Let's go fishing. Now, Peter has been fishing all night without success. He's washed and mended his nets or worked at it. Probably has a little bit of work left to do yet. And he must have found the whole scene ironic. Here is a carpenter's son and a preacher telling me, a fisherman, when it's time to go fishing. Might be a fun trip for you. You can kind of hear it in his voice, right? Hey, this is going to be a fun trip for you. We get to go fishing, but for me, this is work. It's like going fishing with a guide or being a guide as I've been before. And you look up and you go, oh, no. This is going to be a long day. I'm going to be picking things out of docks and trees all day long. So this is where we begin to learn a lot about Simon or Peter, as we will will come to know him. Even more about him than we learn really about Jesus. Peter's reaction is interesting. Obviously, use my boat for a pulpit, great. Go fishing. Wait a minute. We've been fishing all night. The sun's up high. Where do the fish go when the sun gets up high? They go deep, at least the type of fish that that live there. They go deep in the water. The nets aren't rigged to go deep in the water. They're shallow water nets that they fished with at that time. And the nets cannot reach it. Basically, in his mind, Peter's going, this is foolishness. I'm going to waste my time. You know preaching, but you don't know anything about fishing. Look, I just want to go home and get some rest so I can get up again the next night and go fishing when I can really catch something. You ever felt like that? Have you ever had in your mind, Jesus knows about spiritual things. He knows about the church. He knows about the kingdom of God. He knows about forgiving us our sins of grace and mercy. But when it comes to the practical affairs of life, running my home, my business, my retirement accounts, my budget, my time management, I know best on those things. Have you ever had that mindset? Have you ever felt that way before? Have you ever left Jesus out of some of those decisions in your life? Because you think, you know, I know best. There's some practical thought here. I can make those decisions better on my own. This is kind of what Peter's fighting with right now. He knows what he's experienced before. He knows what he's seen. He knows you don't go fishing in the middle of the day, but Peter sees something different about Jesus. While Jesus may not be a fisherman, he still knows there's something special about Jesus, about his words, about his actions, about the way he carries himself. And this is where we begin to see Peter's capability for discipleship. Despite how illogical this whole thing is, this whole adventure is going to be, Peter complied. And then the sign happened. 
Some people say, oh, it's a miracle catch of fish, right? But it really wasn't a miracle because who was involved? You can talk back to me. When I ask a question, you can talk back to me. Who was involved here? Jesus, Jesus, God, right? God in the flesh. God was involved at this point in time. So it really wasn't a miracle for God because God can do anything he wants to do, right? There you go. He can do anything he wants. So it truly was a sign. And what's the difference between a sign and a miracle? A miracle is just an event that happens that's amazing that we can't possibly explain, right? We look at it and go, that's a miracle. We all know what a miracle is. But a sign is something different. A sign is an event that points to something with greater meaning. In this case, who Jesus truly is. This was a sign of who Jesus is. They caught so many fish that they had to ask their partners to come help them. Jesus knew exactly how to get Peter's attention, didn't he? If you want to get a fisherman's attention, what do you do? You catch two boatloads of fish at the wrong time of day, and it makes no sense. Jesus revealed power to Peter Simon, and Simon just sat back and said, whoa, wait a minute. There's not just something special about Jesus. There's something special about Jesus. Stepping back and looking at this, one of the things that's always struck me about this and other signs is the fact that no matter how miraculous these events seem to be, these things that Jesus does. It's funny where they happen. Where do they happen? Our kitchen table, when we're having coffee with friends, when we're out fishing. Oh, wait a minute. How about our weddings? Jesus always shows up at our weddings. He shows up at work. Why? Because he cares about our everyday activities as much as he cares about those miraculous stadium-filled events, if you will. He can reach us one-on-one or two-on-one or two-on-two in these situations. Now, based on a sign that shouldn't have happened at all, Peter recognizes that Jesus is who? God. Because only God or someone who has the power of God can possibly make something like this happen. So Peter does what? Does he react properly? Sure, he does what? He falls on his knees. I'd fall on my knees right now, but I might not be able to get up. So Peter falls on his knees, and he asks Jesus to do what? Leave him. He's still a little mixed up on the concept, right? Peter reacts as a lot of people do. He'll fall on his knees, but he says, whoa, wait a minute, it's too dangerous for me, a sinner, to be around Jesus, God in the flesh. You ever felt like that? When I was a kid, I used to feel like that. I feel, anybody ever play whack-a-mole? Big hammer, mole would pop up and you'd try to hit it before it goes back down. That's how I felt about God when I was younger. I thought God was just, he was like that guy with, holding the mallet with a whack a mole game waiting for me to pop my head up and sin so he could wham. Is that Peter right here? Does he have that thought in his head? Peter's thinking, I can't possibly, it's too dangerous to, for me to be in the presence of God. Has anybody ever given you the line, you don't want me in your church because if I walk through the door, what? Okay, cave in, yeah. Have you ever occurred, 
Ooh, now how about Christians? Now let's point the finger at ourselves, okay? When you point the finger at somebody else, you got four pointing back at you. Let's point the finger at ourselves for a second. Have you ever said to yourself when someone's asked you to do something in the church, I'm not that smart. I'm not that capable. I don't have those skills that you're looking for. Wait a minute, I've never done anything like that before. I know, I gave all those skills when God wanted me to be, I gave all those excuses when God wanted me to be a pastor. Where's Carolyn, right? Had those conversations. Why don't you ask somebody else? They're more capable. We've all done that before, right? I'm too busy. Wait till I retire when I'm less busy. Good luck with that one. Peter knew when he saw the great catch of fish that made logical, no logical sense that Jesus was more than a teacher. He was more than a great prophet, but he was indeed blessed with the power, at least blessed with the power of God, if not God himself. And many people come to understand what Peter understood, but many people never do. Peter confesses his faith not quite grasping the full concept yet, because Peter still thinks it's dangerous to be in the presence of God. How does Jesus respond? It's okay. It's okay. Come and follow me. I will make you a fisher of men. There you go, a fisher of men. Come and follow me, I will make you a fisher of men. And what Peter doesn't realize is it's his humility. It's his honest humility falling down on his knees and saying, go away from me, Lord. That's the exact person that Jesus wants. Because why? Everybody else we're going to run into is in the same boat, right? What what does Paul say? We all sin and fall short of the glory of God, right? So we're all in the same boat. Thank you. We're all in the same boat. Only those who readily admit their sin can begin to be used by God. Because those are the people God is looking for. He knew he could use Peter right then at that moment when Peter fell on his knees and recognized who Jesus is. The response came the same from who? James and John, right? The sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder. That same response came from them. It says they dropped everything and followed him. No longer were they to be fishermen, but now they were to be full-time well, students for a while and soon to be full-time ministers. Now, this brings out a question that always comes up in Bible study for me. Does this mean everybody's supposed to drop their vocation and go into full-time ministry? No. The Bible is filled with numerous examples of where that's not true. Paul, Paul continued his what? Vocation as a tent maker as he traveled. Um, And then how about the legion? You remember the legion, person filled with many demons after Jesus healed them? He wanted to follow Jesus. He wanted to be one of the people following Jesus. He wanted to be a disciple. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. Go back to your family and... Share your story. You're way more viable to me, Jesus said, going back to your family and showing them how you have changed. And the bulk of the people Jesus healed, that's what he did. He sent them back out to their families, their friends, the neighborhoods, and their communities. And that's what most of us are called 
to do. To go out in our workplaces, our families, and our communities. So the story begs us to ask the question, what do, what do people have in common? What was the common denominator of these people to be a disciple? We've established one thing, we have to recognize our sinfulness, right? I am a sinner and I'm in need of a savior. I'm in need of Jesus Christ. So if we look at everything else, were they all from, there were a few of them that were fishermen, but for the most part, there was a variety of jobs that they held, a variety of occupations. Um, there were men and there were women who followed Jesus. There were people with varied backgrounds. Some were more wealthy, some were less wealthy, some were out more outgoing, some were less outgoing, some were very peaceful, some were described as zealots. Some were more educated, some were not educated at all to speak of. But what did they have in common? All these differences, but they had one thing in common. They said what? Yes. They said yes. When Jesus said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men, they said yes. In other words, they made themselves available to Jesus. What if Peter had said, you know, I know fishing better than you do. And I really need to get some sleep so I can go catch some fish the next day. Oh, wow. Look what Peter would have missed out on. Look what we would have missed out on. I, I love Peter because Peter's just like me. He takes two steps forward and three steps back, two steps forward, one step back, right? We can all relate to Peter. We do great things and then all of a sudden we mess up. My friends, even when it seems pointless, somebody someday is going to ask you to talk to somebody, and you're going to look at that person and you're going to go, Lord, you really don't want me to talk to that person. I know that person. Oh, who was that? I think that was Paul. Or, wait a minute. Nineveh, anybody? Jonah? Hey, I want you to go to Nineveh. Well, we all know Jonah's response to that, but we all know Nineveh's response once Jonah got there. We have to be available to God's leading. We must be available to God's leading. I'll close up here with four quick points. First of all, Peter responds based on who? Jesus, right? He responds totally based on Jesus. Not what he knows, not what he thinks he knows, not what he's seen his whole life, but based on Jesus. And that's what our response always needs to be based on. It needs to be based on Jesus. Less what we see, less what we know, and more on Jesus. Knowing that Jesus can do anything he wants. And he can do anything through us that he desires us to do. Peter was humble. Peter understood that he didn't have anything to offer Jesus except his boat. Oh, wait a minute. What was his boat? His boat was his treasure. His boat was his talent. And his boat also was time. The three standards of stewardship. Time, 
talent, and treasure. And he was willing to what? Make those available to God. Oh, we didn't know you were going to have a stewardship sermon today too, did you? Nobody ran. That's good. Peter, along with James and John, are willing to leave everything to follow him. You may not be asked to do that. But you will be asked to give up something. If, some, if Jesus asks you to do something new in the church, in his ministry, unless your calendar is wide open and you spend a lot of time doing nothing, you're going to have to give up something to do what Jesus is asking you to do. So we have to be willing to give up something. You're here this morning. You gave up something, right? Praise God. Praise God. And Jesus teaches us here that sinners who repent and turn to God can always be used by Christ. My friends, make yourself available to Jesus because the work we do for God, it lasts forever and ever and ever. And there is no greater feeling than to watch your friend be baptized in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. There's no greater feeling than to have a friend or someone you've looked at in the past your whole life and say, I'm a sinner and I'm in need of forgiveness and Jesus Christ is my Savior. Have you ever had a friend do that? Is there any greater feeling in the world? There's not, is there? All of God's people said, amen.
at this time you've made a decision that you'd like to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you want to tell the world about that, or you want to rededicate yourself to our Lord and Jesus as your Savior, or if you simply want to join Blaine Christian Church, please come forward as we sing. It's a time in our service that we get to come to the Lord in prayer to offer our praises and our prayers for people. First one I'd like to offer for is uh, for Jonathan Kmitchik. Uh God knows why on that. Uh, just be in prayer for him for healing. What else do you have? Keith. Thanks for filling out the card, Keith. I appreciate that. Oh, it's Veterans Day, so a prayer for all the veterans out there. All right, thank you. All right. Your guitar. Jackie. I have a praise. My son Jason has been, that we've all been praying for, has been cleared to return back to work full time. You didn't hear that? Her son Jason has been cleared. He's been dealing with cancer, correct? He's been dealing, uh, brain cancer, was it? Or? Uh, uh, melanoma. Melanoma? Um, but he's been able to return to work full time. And continued prayers for this big guy for strength in him. Continued prayers for Doug for uh, healing and strength as he still deals with the effects of radiation and chemo and all that. We're thankful you're here, Doug. Yeah. I was already up here, Kathy. That's not allowed. <laughs> I have a praise to share. We had 15 people yesterday helping to pack, operate the Christmas tub boxes, and we got it all done in an hour. Wow. Kathy said there's a praise because yesterday all those the 205 boxes that are over there, I know some of them were filled beforehand, but there was 15 people here to pack and it only took them one hour to do that. I must say the apple pies too, we had like 40 people there. It took us four hours <laughs> to do 700 pies and it was amazing. And This is a great church. So thankful. Would you go to the Lord in prayer with me? 
Holy God, we are your people, the folks that you have called together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, to witness to your world. We are those whom you have ordained to be a light in an ever-darkening place. Help us now to shine brightly. Lord, send us out as powerful instruments of your peace and your presence. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we might radiate your love and walk with us each day so that we may constantly hear your voice and travel the paths you are calling us to tread. And Lord, as we do, please strengthen us for the journeys we will face. Lord, we also have some fellow travelers on our daily paths that especially need your strength and support right now. Please lift them up as well. We lift up Doug, that you would continue to heal and give him strength. We lift up Jason, Jason, we're thankful that he's been able to return to work and ask that you continually heal his body. Lord, we pray for Jonathan Kmitchik. Be with him, Lord. Lord, we're thankful for all the veterans who have uh, allowed this country to be a country that can praise you openly without fear. And Lord, I am thankful for this church. I'm thankful that we have people who are willing to take part of their Saturday and put together boxes and take, part, take a chunk out of their Friday and make pies to raise money so that we can go out into this world and, and make a difference according to your will. We're thankful for this group of people, Lord. Lord, we know that you answer prayers in your time and according to your will. Please release our anxieties for these concerns from us and give us confidence in your active grace within our lives. Guide us in our walk with your Son and help us to pray as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God calls us to be available to him to spread the gospel message to everyone we meet. As a way to help strengthen us for this task, he offers this opportunity to come to his table and be nourished through the actions of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Eternal God, you have formed us in love. You watch over us in love. You lovingly call us to faithful discipleship. As we eat this bread and drink this cup, we thank you for your eternal loving kindness, best revealed to us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we partake of this meal, open our ears to hear your word better, open our eyes to better see the world's needs, and open our hearts that we may serve you. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks to God for it, he broke it and said, This is my body given for you. Whenever you eat of it, do it in remembrance of me. After supper had finished, he took the cup and gave thanks again, and then said, This is the blood of the new covenant. Whenever you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. The table is set. Please come and enjoy God's fellowship. Mm -hmm. 